So you think Dave Kopel is just a research director at the Independence Institute, just does the Second Amendment project, just does the occasional adult film, just does the occasional clown thing for kids. No, you're actually a lawyer. Indeed I am, admitted to practice in 1985. Really? Chicago. Actually, 86. Chicago? University of Michigan Law School. I was first admitted in New York State and then in Colorado. What was your first gig here in Colorado? You worked for the AG's office, didn't you? I, I did uh, hazardous waste enforcement for, the, for Colorado Attorney General Dwayne Woodard. And then when he lost the election, I continued in that same job for uh, the new Attorney General, Gail Norton. And when did you hook up with II? It was before I even got to the Independence Institute. Um, so I'd been living in New York and then moved back home to Colorado in 1988 and uh, pretty quickly hooked up with Independence Institute as a, as a writer for them and then started working here full time in November 1992. I remember it like it was yesterday. All right. So beyond just the scholarly work you do, uh, being, I'll, I'll put it out as the nation's leading scholar on the Second Amendment and the original meeting of the Second Amendment, you get involved in a lot of legal cases. I'm not saying that you're there uh, playing Clarence Darrow and, and uh, this, yeah. you're out of order. Yeah. This whole court's out of order. You do something called amicus briefs, and you do a lot of them. Explain them. Okay, so um, amicus is the Latin word for a friend. I said amicus, that's how it's pronounced. Okay. Amicus. <laughs> amicus. So an, an amicus curiae brief is a brief that's a friend of the court where you try to give the, you're not a party to the case, but you file the brief to provide the court with additional information that's not coming from, from the parties. How often do judges or courts look at those briefs, those friends of courts briefs? Uh, frequently. Now, it, it, it depends on the judge and on the case. So a few years ago, I was talking with in, uh, Justice Scalia at an Independence Institute event where he was the speaker, and I, I asked him about that. And he said, you know, at the U.S. Supreme Court level, you can get a lot of amicus briefs coming in. And so the, at that level, certainly the, the judges rely on their clerks to screen the briefs and, and pick out the, the best ones or the ones that you know, say something novel, but he, he said he would always read uh, a brief from uh, a, a group that sort of had expertise in the area. So if it was a, uh, uh, a labor law case, he would always make sure to personally read the brief from the AFL-CIO. Or if it was a, a free speech case, he'd make sure to read the ACLU brief. And the idea is that even though you've got two parties in a case battling it out in front of the courts, they might not get every nuance or they might have their point of view, that uh, argument, but there's other facts, other political and legal theories that uh, you want to show have precedent in law. Is that, am I basically uh, saying that right? Exactly. And you, you might have some, some expertise. So, you know, maybe there's a, a case about criminal defendants' rights and the lawyer for the criminal is, or accused criminal, is, is doing her best and writes a good brief on that, but say a group like the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, or on the other side, uh, a, a prosecutor's association, can come in and, and provide the court with some broader perspective on whatever the issue is in the case. All right, well, let's fast forward though. You, you and uh, another colleague at Independence, Rob Nadelson, have paired up on lots of different ones. You've done uh, a lot uh, individually. Your your briefs, amicus briefs, have have been used in rulings quite often. I, I, I want to get into a Colorado case that you just wrote one on, but I, before we do that, just to, to lay groundwork, the Heller decision on gun rights, the McDonald decision, uh, your work was featured in those rulings. Well, or, I'm not uh, at least cited in that. Yeah. There, there have been nine Supreme Court cases where uh, our... Uh, sometimes in, in a dissenting or concurring opinion, where either our brief or scholarship by me or by Rob Nadelson uh, was cited by one of the justices. How many times? Nine. That, that's nine more times than I have. That, it's, it's not... Yeah. It, it's an important thing, and it's, it's a real bragging right, isn't it? 
Come on, be honest. Oh, we're just be trying to be the friend of the Dude, court, and we're glad we can help him out a little bit. All right. I, I want to. We'll talk about the gun case in a second. There's a case uh, about the uh, taxpayer bill of rights. You've just written another one of these amicus briefs. Explain it to me. Okay. So I'll, a little background on the case. The in uh, the last election, the voters passed this uh, uh, new law to create a tax uh, for family and and to pay for family and, and medical leave. So we're talking about the Family Leave Act, which. Uh, it's basically a brand new tax, and it says that employers and employees have to share in this tax for what is the most luxurious family leave benefits that have ever been seen in America. They're absolutely not, in my opinion, and opinion of lots of other people, not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. But we're, but this is the case you're, you're talking about. It, exactly, and of okay. course it's sustainable because part of the provision is there's this special commission that's created that can raise the tax whenever it wants without, without a vote without a vote of, of the people so there's a lawsuit over that uh, called Cronus Builders versus Colorado Department of Labor and their particular argument in the case is there's a provision in the taxpayers bill of rights uh, that by one reading says you and you can't have income tax rates have to be the same. You can't tax, you know, whatever the income tax is. We have a flat the, income tax flat, in Colorado, yeah. and it's now locked into the Constitution. Everybody pays it. It's fair and it's the right. same. And the way, and this, this tax is not like that, uh, but they call it, so they, instead they call it a fee instead of a tax. And the argument is that this text of the Colorado Constitution also applies to, to fees and, and other government revenue raising. And the argument against it, the Attorney General, of course, is, is defending it, says no, this particular language in, in Colorado only applies to the income tax. So our brief, Amicus Curia, a friend of the court, doesn't get into that one way or the other. We don't tell the court how you should read that particular provision. What we simply say is, and it's a brief that's filed in support of, of neither party, your honors, when you interpret the taxpayer's bill of rights, you should interpret it according to the rule of interpretation that the Colorado that the Colorado Constitution requires. The taxpayer's bill of rights adopted by the voters says the first sentence is here's what the effective date will be. The second sentence says its preferred interpretation shall most reasonably restrain the growth of government. Let me stop you there. So I was involved on the edges of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights 1992 when it, when it passed. This so was the third time um, it went up for a vote and it passed. And it's been controversial. The Colorado Supreme Court has neutered it and neutered it and neutered it at almost every opportunity. Coming up with such things as, if you call it a fee, uh, and you don't have to ask the people because it's not a tax. All yeah. sorts of things. And I've always wondered about this, so help me out. At the beginning of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, when you read it, yeah, you say effective date, and it has this first <coughs> clause, and it basically says, I'll use my language, hey, judges of the future, when you're looking at a case, um, the preferred interpretation, you should interpret this as to whatever restrains the growth of government the most. So do I have it yes. right that this yes. is this this declaratory clause is to say hey when you, when courts are looking at it let's give you some direction. The people are voting on this and they want it to mean this the law means whatever constrains government growth. Yes. Most that's how you have to rule. Yes, with the rule that it's it has to be a reasonable interpretation. So if there was only one reasonable interpretation, then you just do whatever that reasonable interpretation is. But in, a lot of times in law, there might be several reasonable interpretations of a constitutional provision. What, what do you mean a reasonable interpretation? That's a nice little law term. An interpretation means I read it this way, you read it that way. 
And are you, they both and, reasonable, or are you just an idiot? Well, can both, and that's part of the things courts work on, um, and it's ultimately, I suppose, up to the judge judges to decide. But if the judge says, "Yeah, this this you you could read it one way, or you could read it the other," in that situation, the taxpayer's bill of rights tells the judge how to interpret it. Pick the interpretation that most reasonably restrains the growth of government. Okay, so it let doesn't me, have to say you got to shrink government. It just says restrain growth. So in my case, where someone says, "Wait a second, um, uh, you're calling a tax a fee so that you don't get uh, you don't have to ask the people." So, for instance, um, the bed tax. We're the only state that calls a hospital bed tax a fee. That way it goes around uh, around yeah. the, the public. So if if that case were to go up and say, hey, this is a tax, you th- this is unconstitutional, you would think that the judges would say, all right, let me let me see. Whichever one of these, and now they both have, you know, yeah. there are two, two things. No, it's not a tax. Yes, it is a tax. Whichever one most reasonably restrains the growth of government, you think that would make it very clear that this is a tax. That, that's right. The, the judge says, oh, the one lawyer, some lawyers had good arguments why you should think of it as a fee. Other lawyers had good arguments about whether you should consider it a tax. They're, they're both plausible, reasonable arguments. No, so I think now, one is absolutely stupid and inane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to, so I'll look at the, at the, fir, at the well, first. We just, we just so, raised yeah. the gas tax. Yeah. We've never called a gas tax in Colorado a fee ever before. Ever right. in the history of Colorado, yeah. never, but now we're going to pay an eight cents more gas fee just for the just to make sure it doesn't go to the to the people. It sure seems like a tax. Exactly, and since you, that's a reasonable argument. The court that that obeyed our Colorado Constitution would say, since there's competing reasonable arguments, we must choose the one that most restrains the growth of government which in that case would be to say, if you want to raise gas taxes or tax hospitals, fine, just go and ask the people about it. The Constitution under Tabor also says, if you're going to raise debt, you have to ask permission. Yes. So unlike the federal government that can just you know, do debt, and I get it. Yeah. Sometimes you want to raise the debt so you can build the school or build the stadium or build whatever. Great. You ask people, can we can we go into debt to do this? And people overwhelmingly say yes when they understand what the project is. But they said, I tell you what, instead of calling it debt, if you call it a certificate of participation, a COP, C-O-P, which says instead of a 30-year bond or 30-year mortgage, what we're going to do is we're going to have 31-year mortgages all in a row. So that way it's not a it's not an over a year long instrument, but we're gonna do a, almost a year instrument and then re-up it and then re-up it and then re-up it every year for 30 years, which is the exact same as, as a bond, as a regular yes. mortgage. But the, the court said, oh no, no, for certificates of participation, COPS, these, this little stacking game that they do of one yeah. year bonds, that's, that's completely different. It seems to me that if, even if you could make an argument for that, which I don't think you can, there are two sides to this. The one that most reasonably restrains growth has to be this one where you ask for voter permission yes. compared to this one where you do not ask for voter consent. That That's right, since you could make reasonable arguments on both sides of whether getting into something where you're going to have 30 uh, one-year leases and have 30 of them in a row uh, with the same effect as if you did a 30-year mortgage. Um, is, that base, is that, in fact, debt? And you could make argument, no, it's not, it's just a lease. You know, you're, n- you're not in debt when you sign a one-year lease on your apartment. Um, or you could say, no, we're going to look at the, the actual meaning but of this you, transaction. You signed on for 30 leases to be run consecutively. Um, and but you, you, can always, you can always skip out. So after you've... I mean, it's the same as like when you buy a TV. But you can't with a certificate of participation. On a a rent-to-own thing. Like instead of buying the TV, you you pay on a month-by-month rental, and then, you know, after four years, you paid so much in the rental that you you could have bought three TVs, but 
you know, any given month you can you can stop and say I don't want to renew. So that's the legal fiction that it's not debt. And what Tabor instructs is, let's say both of these arguments are, are legally reasonable, and I, I think both are, um, then you prefer the one that most reasonably restrains the growth of government, which is if you want to go into a debt that's in effect going to be a 30-year debt on the, imposed on the taxpayers, ask. We can do this over and over with almost every taxpayer bill of rights case that has gone up to the Supreme Court, including from the mill levy freeze to a bag fee that you are forced to pay, yeah. even though the bag fee doesn't go to bags. Uh, the faster fee, which is a car tax, even though um, uh, people pay it and get no services from it all over the state, they're still paying in certain areas of the state. Their roads haven't been improved. There nothing's, they, there's nothing there. So throughout all this, that, that declaration that says, hey, judges, you, you need to rule this way. You need to uh, uh, go in this direction if there are competing. It's just been yeah. completely ignored. Am I wrong on this? I'm, I mean, you're, you're the lawyer. I'm, I'm just a commentator. No, it hasn't been completely ignored. It's been actually explicitly nullified by the Colorado Supreme Court, which has this idea that it has the power uh, to write language out of the Constitution. Well, doesn't it? <laughs> I suppose in practice yeah, that's I mean, true. Because we cannot take this case to the U.S. Supreme Court because it's a, a case about the Colorado that's Constitution. Right. That's right. So just like the feds can can out of whole cloth make words up, uh, the, the Tabor says if you want to override Tabor, that is keep all the excess money and not return it, you can have a public vote and do it for up to four years. Yeah, and it's not even overriding Tabor. It's just asking. It, it, Tabor, keeping, keeping Tabor, is, Tabor is not anti-tax, anti-spending. It's just saying once you want to raise those beyond existing levels, you including inflation, just ask. Yeah, exactly. Just yes. but And if you ask for it, you can keep the excess revenue for up to four years. The Supreme Court has ruled four years shall be interpreted as forever. Forever. And so you've got 80% of, of uh, maybe even more now, of municipalities have permanently debruced. That is, they will always keep excess tax revenues. The people who pay those excess tax revenues will never be refunded because there's no limit to it. Right, and a lot of those were through, uh, some of those were actually things where the, the people at least understood what they were voting for. But many of them were quite deceptively worded, you know, where they, they made it seem like we're just asking to keep the money for this particular Perfect. thing. And then they threw in some language at the end, you know, and everything else notwithstanding any other law. All right. So is there a parallel in federal law to uh, federal constitution to these kind of um, declarations that says, hey, future courts, rule this way, interpret it this way. We meant this. When we write this and pass it, we want to be so clear about it. We want to make clear that we mean this, in this case, to restrain the growth of government the most. Are there other cases or other laws, even in Colorado, where, where those declarations are out there for judges? Sure. Is this completely uncommon? No, no. Uh, some, some federal statutes and some Colorado statutes include express interpretive rules. Uh, the U.S. Constitution doesn't have any express interpretive rules in it, and most of the Colorado Constitution doesn't have express in interpretive rules. A, a, a few do. A few parts of our Constitution do. Uh, uh, for example, um, the provision against taking private property for private use, which is forbidden in Colorado, says whenever there's a case about, well, was this taking really for a public use or for a private use? So that's a question for the courts to decide. You can't just rely on what the legislature claims that it was a, a public use. And our Colorado courts have actually completely blown that off and said, no, if the legislature says it's for a public use, that's good enough for us. Okay. <laughs> so I heard you. So not only is it normal to have these kind of clauses that say, hey, judges, interpret it this way, but it's also been normal for the Colorado courts to go, we don't care what the Constitution says. We'll interpret it any way we want. Yes. 
I'll sleep better at night. So for what, uh, what do you hope to do with this amicus brief, amicus brief? Well, it's, we don't, the brief doesn't take any position on the particular, right. uh, you know, issue about the, the, the fee or tax uh, for the, the family leave thing. It simply says, it basically says, if you, however you, it's up to you to interpret whatever that language means, but your general rule is, if when you're interpreting things, you find there are two reasonable interpretations, the Constitution tells you to choose the one that most restrains the growth of government, and the Constitution is, after all, the law. It's above the Colorado Supreme Court, and it's above uh, the case from about 14 years ago where the court actually said, no, our actual rule is whatever leads to the most growth of government, whatever the government wants, that's the one we will choose. What's your desired outcome here? It seems to me that the justices understand full well the interpretive clause. Yes. That my guess is they can read it just like I can read it. Uh, uh, and they're not even dyslexic. They could probably read it better than yes. I can read it. Yes. And it says, hey, judges, you need to interpret it this way. And they just give it the middle finger. Why, why will this brief help? Well, ever since Tabor was enacted by the people as the supreme law of our state, the Colorado Supreme Court has varied between having a 7-0 majority that hates the taxpayer's Bill of Rights with a passion or as small as a 4-3 majority that hates the taxpayer's Bill of Rights. With a passion. Yes. And um, on, I don't think there's any realistic chance of the court, the current court, uh, overturning the errors, the anti-constitutional usurpations uh, of its predecessors. But at least if we're going to start to fight to reclaim the enforcement of our Constitution as it's actually written, we've at least got to start putting these issues before the judges and making some of, some of them aware of that. And just like the clause itself of saying, this is how it shall be interpreted, these things, these things are court records. These yes. things get pulled up later. And what amazes me, and I think the left does this so much better than the right, is they think in terms of decades, not in terms of yeah. just this one case. So they build up legal cases over time. And so to be able to pull out a brief from five years ago and say, hey, new judges, this argument was made before, you might want to look at it. It, it has value, if not today, in the future. Hopefully, yes, and, and you're right. All the with electronic filing these days, um, everything's electronically available going forward to the to the court, and it's on legal databases like Lexis and Westlaw that that lawyers in general uh, use. But are ideally in a generation, uh, we might get back to having a court that actually enforces our constitution, which means you have tax and debt by consent. I mean, you know, that, that's what our revolution was about. You know, no taxation without representation. That's, you give consent through representation in the, as of 1776, and you, in Colorado, we specify how right. the and people give consent. I think about this one a lot. It's that I've heard legislators say, you know, I am the consent. Who has the right to raise your taxes? Well, you elected me. I have the right. Well, here in Colorado, we value so much the idea of no taxation without representation. We have taken the level of consent so that you just don't have the consent of people we elected. You have to have the consent of the people who pay the taxes. We have put together a protection that says you can grow government as large as you like. You can put your kids into debt for as much as you like but you must get the consent of the people who are paying those taxes and who are going into debt. It is no different in my mind than the rallying cry for the revolution of no taxation without representation. Am I wrong on this? No, I know, I think you're right because the government is, as President Obama said, it, it's the things we do together and how we do it together 
has to be by consent. You can have all kinds of different forms of consent. You know, back in, in Magna Carta, which started this principle, the consent was, well, before raising taxes, the king has to talk to his, his council. The about lords. It. The, the, yeah, the, other, the, the, other, the other thugs. The, well, the, the, yeah, the, the high end of the lords on, on the yeah. king's council. And later that was, ex the council eventually became parliament, was, which was elected by the people. And over time, more and more people could vote for parliament. That was one form of consent. Uh, the American revolutionaries didn't believe that a parliament in which there were no Americans uh, had consent you know, to tax an American store that sold playing cards or stationery uh, to another American. And ultimately, in, you keep refining what consent means. In Colorado, consent me is defined by the Constitution. That, that's our law. That, that's the basis in which this whole society it's not just, operates together. It's not together. even just our law. It is a representation of the collective value of Coloradans. Yeah. That even if you poll them today, and the reason why they go around Tabor, and that's the reason why they call things fees and to avoid taxes or yeah. call things a certificate of participation to avoid uh, a voter consent is because they know they won't pass. And you even right. have proof when you have governors like Hickenlooper speaking in front of business groups saying, well, we'd bring this hospital provider tax uh, to the people, but we've all seen the polling, which means he knows what yeah. the consent of the people is and that they would deny it, so they're going to find a way to do it anyway. That's more than hubris. That, that. It's a usurpation of power. The, Better put. The people in our government have power because we the people, who were the sovereigns, that's what our constitution says, the people of Colorado are the sovereigns, and they have the sole and exclusive right of governing themselves. To, in, in doing that, they create government offices, Supreme Court justices, district court judges, state representatives, mayors, all these things. They create these offices and give, give people power to carry out actions under the Constitution. Nobody who exists as a government officer in Colorado can be above the Constitution. But, you know, that, that, that's like the guy who thinks he's smarter than God and he can order God around. Yes, and they all sit on the Colorado Supreme Court bench because they have, those seven people have given those hundred people the power to do just what you said by rewriting the Constitution. Well, or by ignoring it or defying it, right. yes. But it, 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 that's, that's an act of power. It's not an act of law. Say more about that. That's an interesting statement. It's more an act of power than an act of law. If they're the Supreme Court, can't they say, whatever I say is law? They are the legal gods of the Colorado Constitution. Uh, they have a lot of discretion. They are the Pope. Yeah, and the Pope has a lot of power too, but he's governed uh, by, uh, the Catholic Church would say, among other things, the Bible and things like that. So the Pope, but he's the guy who interprets the Bible. Yeah, and, and, and if you got a clause... I'm that, telling you, the court uh, is the Pope of Colorado. And if you got a Bible clause that you, or you know, verse that you can read two ways, and the Pope says this is the right way to read it, then from a Catholic point of view, that's it. But a Pope uh, can't change what's in the Bible. If the Bible says uh, Jesus fed people with the loaves and fishes... Uh, the Pope can't say, no, Jesus actually like uh, took the day off and uh, uh, spent the day uh, talking about sports. And so the Colorado Supreme Court has a lot of interpretive power over what do words mean and things like that. But when the words are clear, the Colorado Supreme Court can't act as if those words uh, could be replaced by different words. From a political point of view, what you're doing with this, what you've done with all your work, is to educate electors, of voters, that this is going on. And the end of the day, the only way we get a better Supreme Court is to get better Senate and a better governor 
uh, and those who well, nominate not not a course. senate they don't uh, the justices well, aren't confirmed oh that's right they're not confirmed i'm sorry they should be confirmed yeah uh but the uh I've, i'm trying to remember uh who does the three nominations in colorado it's kind of a weird thing there's a uh judicial there's a, there are, there are judicial nominating commissions that are uh, basically con- a, a, appointed and controlled by the governor, and they, like for a Supreme Court vacancy, would prevent the, present the governor with a choice of three. So, before Bill Owens, there was 24 years without a Republican governor. Yeah. Uh, and that's been now, uh, what, since 2006? Yeah. You know, so we've had another uh, 14 years in plus without a Republican governor, and the court's show that it is a a one-sided, that there's no ideological diversity, and we're paying the cost for it. So voters need to think about, you're not just voting for the governor, you're voting for the courts as well. Right, and you're also voting for a state representative and a state senator, and they have their oath to obey the Constitution, and there's a lot of them uh, who don't even know what's in the Colorado Constitution. You know, it's like, oh, I take an oath to uphold it, uh, but I've got no idea what's in it. It's like, yeah, I'm, sure, I'm, 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 I'll go through the marriage ceremony, but I have no idea who I'm getting married <laughs> to. All right, wrap this up for us. With this and all the other briefs that you've done, they have power. It's interesting to me that the briefs you have written for federal cases have been cited and used several times by the U.S. Supreme Court. Here in Colorado, you've got this one. It would sure be nice if the Colorado Supreme Court saw the value of your work the way the federal one does. That would in, indeed be swell, and uh, we, we're, we're, we're doing our best. But you, you, gotta at least, you, you can't even criticize the court for, for usurping power it doesn't have unless the public understands what power our different branches of government have and do not have. People want to read the brief, can they? Where do, where? I'll go to my website, davecopel.org. It's, right, it's there on the front page. Have you ever been to davecopel.org? You open it up, it looks like the old white pages. It's just too much information. I actually uh, worked with a, uh, a web design company in India over the past year, and it is a, uh, a cleaner layout than it used to be. All right, I'll go take a look, davecopel.org. Thanks. Thanks. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.